Hi, it's Justin Zeltzer again on zstatistics.com or my YouTube channel of the same name, presenting here the second video in a set of two on categorical data and proportions testing. The first video, for which I'll put a link up right here, dealt with uh, two group comparisons and multiple group comparisons. So we're looking at both uh, the Z test and the chi-squared test and when it's appropriate to use either of those. Um, but in this video, we're going to focus on relative risk and odds ratios, uh, which are both very common terms in health data, um, or in fact, any data where you're dealing with adverse outcomes like mortality or injury. Um, but too often they're confused. And I think people tend to lose sight of what these terms actually represent. So I'm hoping that this presentation is going gonna, is gonna to help you remember what they are. So the subject matter of the video is tennis elbow, which is clearly not a silent killer, but I thought that was just a fun way of dealing with proportions and categorical data. So for this part of the video, we're going to ask the question, does the double-handed backhand technique protect against tennis elbow? So of course, we're going to need to have a look at some data to assess whether that's true or not. So here we have a population distribution um, of all the tennis players let's say in Australia, and there's 225,000 of them, uh, almost 50,000 of which are single-handed backhand players, and 176-odd thousand are double-handed backhand players. Um, so there's a lot of information, or a lot of data in this table, which I've noted here is theoretical because you're never ever going to see a population distribution. Otherwise, there's not much point of doing inferential statistics because you've got the whole population in front of you. But this is a really good starting point to get your head around what risks and odds represent. So if I was to ask you what the risk is of tennis elbow, TE, for single-handed backhand players, I'm sure you'd tell me it's 437 divided by the total, 49573. Now, the great thing about risk is that it's completely interpretable. If I see a risk of 0.00882, I can tell you that's 0.8% or 0.9% if we're rounding up. So the risk of developing tennis elbow for a single-handed backhand player is 0.9%. To me, that makes a lot of sense. It's very intuitive. And you can do the same for double-handed backhand players and say that it's 0.3%. If I was a double-handed backhand player, I would have a 0.3% chance of developing tennis elbow. It makes sense. Odds are a little bit more complex, or at least a little bit less intuitive. So let's see what, how to calculate them. We take the frequency in the tennis elbow column, so 437, and then we divide by what's in the non-tennis elbow category. So the odds of developing tennis elbow for single-handed backhanders is 437 divided by blah, 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 and that's 0.00889. Now, that's actually less interpretable. I mean, in, odds are a very common measure, but I have difficulty actually appreciating what that means in my head. And of course, we can do the same for double-handed backhand players. Now, let's have a look at relative risk, also termed risk ratio. That's actually a division of the single-handed risk over the double-handed risk. So 0 0.00882 divided by 0 0.00309. Now, again, this figure that we get here is very interpretable. A single-handed backhand player has 2.855 times the risk of developing tennis elbow as that of a double-handed backhand player. So, clearly a much higher risk for single-handed players. If we scroll over to what the odds ratio represents, and again, it's as simple as just dividing the two odds, and we get 2.872. Now, we can interpret this. We can say that Single-handed backhand players have 2.872 times the odds of developing tennis elbow compared to double-handed. But again, I find that not very satisfying. I can't really see in my head what that actually means, as I could with the risk ratio. So you might ask, what's the point of odds ratios? Why do we have them around? Why don't we just deal with relative risks? Well, let's see why odds ratios are very useful. 
Appreciate that we were just looking at a population distribution, which, as I said, is very unrealistic. You're never going to have information on that many people. So what more commonly happens, especially when you're dealing with a very rare condition, like tennis elbow in this case, is you tend to sample from those suffering from tennis elbow and also from those in the general community that do not have tennis elbow. This is called a case control study. And it's very common to studies of cancer, for example, where you're not about to spend all of your money studying the entirety of a population. So you're going to go straight to the people that have the cancer, sample quite a few of those, and then also sample people, which we call the controls, that do not have the condition. Now, my question at this point is, which of the following measures can be estimated from this sample? And we saw all of these on the previous slide. And as I was saying, I preferred measures of risk and even risk ratio because uh, I, I found that more intuitive. But believe it or not, only the odds ratio can be estimated from this kind of data where you've got a case control structure. Now, why is that? Well, let's have a look at the actual table itself. If I was trying to calculate the risk of tennis elbow for single-handed backhand players, I'm going to go 44 divided by 69, and that's going to be about, what, 70%, which clearly that's, that's really high, but that's because we're completely underrepresenting the non-tennis elbow contingent. We've only selected 100 people with not that don't have tennis elbow, whereas in reality, this group would be much more populous. So by design, risks are impossible actually to calculate here, as is the risk ratio, because we don't have the individual risks. The individual odds, again, are impossible to calculate because 44 divided by 25, that's going to be a, an odds which is extremely high because, again, we're underrepresenting by a long way those without tennis elbow. The odds ratio, though, can be calculated. And let's have a look and see how that's done. It's a bit of a trick. So why can only the odds ratio be estimated from this type of sample? Well, it boils down to the formula for odds ratio in itself. We learnt that it was A on B divided by C on D. Now, without too much work, we can actually transform this formula. So it's A on C divided by B on D. And why that's useful is that effectively it's framing it in terms of each of these separate samples. So that within this tennis elbow sample of 100 people, we can find A on C which is effectively the odds of being single-handed within the tennis elbow sample. And we can do the same for the non-tennis elbow sample. We can go B on D, which is the odds of being single-handed within the non-tennis elbow sample, and appreciate that that sort of odds ratio is the same as the previous one. So the odds ratio is a consistent measure when we have this case control structure. And that's effectively why it's used. That's why we have these, this thing called odds, which might not be as interpretable as risk, but very functional. So let's actually calculate it. And here we've gone 44 divided by 25 to get the odds for single-handed players and divided that by the odds for double-handed players and we get 2.357. So that's our estimate for the odds ratio based on this sample. Now, hopefully you're thinking at this point that we need some kind of confidence interval around this odds ratio because, of course, it is a sample. And whenever we're sampling, there's, there's obviously some variation about it. How do we find that confidence interval? But it's a little bit more tricky than just using a normal distribution like we had before because the odds ratio in itself is positively skewed. Think about it. If there's no difference between the two categories, the odds is going to be 1 but the actual scale of the odds ratio goes from zero to infinity. So it's clearly going to have a really positive skew to it, which means we're going to have to take the log of the odds ratio. And that's approximately normally distributed, meaning that we can now use a very simple calculation for a measure of the variance. It's a bit funny. It's just the square root of this summation. And A, B, C, and D are all those frequencies within that table. And if we do that, and you can check my working here if you'd like, we get 0 0.306. So we now have a sample estimate, and we have the standard error. So we can go the estimate plus or minus effectively two lots of this standard error, or 1.96 lots, because don't forget when you deal with a normal distribution, 
1.96 standard deviations either side gives you a 95% confidence interval. So we can find that 95% confidence interval for the log odds ratio. And then all we need to do is just exponentiate that or essentially unlog it to get our confidence interval for the odds ratio. So here we can say that we have a 95% confidence that the odds ratio is between 1.293 and 4.298. So that's quite a large interval. But importantly, you'll notice that the odds ratio is greater than one. The value of one does not exist in that interval. So we can say with confidence that single-handed backhands increase the risk of tennis elbow. So that's it, and that's about a whirlwind tour of uh, relative risk and odds ratios. Feel free to check out zstatistics.com, that's the letter Z and then statistics.com, for all sorts of stats videos presented in a very sort of intuitive fashion like this one perhaps was too. I'll catch you next time.